Yeah, and welcome back to La Cancha Podcast. And the biggest game of the weekend, we're going to start with Alaves Granada. No, just joking. El Clasico. And <laughs> it was a surreal game in so many ways. You had the different jerseys. Normally, Real Madrid plays in white, Barcelona plays in the blau grana kit. But this time, it was Real Madrid in black, Barcelona in the Senera. And it was a weird scoreline as well, weird lineup from Ancelotti. Uh, Tapio is our guest here. He rep- is going to represent the Real Madrid side. Oscar, as you might know, is a Barcelona fan. So I'm going to start with Tapiwa. What was Ancelotti thinking? You know, I'm I'm not really sure. And up to now, I'm still like scratching my head on what that decision was because I think we spoke on Friday before the game about like what Benzema's absence would lead to, and I think everyone was predicting okay the system would stay the same but maybe we would plug in Asensio in that role or uh, plug in Jovic or plug in Mariano but Carlo decided to go with ideas of his own which you know in the end as we know now backfired (laughs) yeah because in the past like that formation has worked against Barca but with Benzema there Benzema and Vinicius or Benzema and Asensio being the two or Benzema and Cristiano but this time, it, it's, it was like the players had no idea what was going on. There was no system. I was like scratching my head to see what was happening. And it, it looked like as in the second half after Barcelona went up 2-0, it got even worse for Real Madrid because Kamavinga came in and I think it was a center back. Yeah, so Kamavinga initially came in as a center back and then there was a time when Casemiro got dropped back there. And I don't know why they just kept like chopping and changing. And then... Like, after that, the confidence was just shot and, you know, there was no going back from there. Because I think the game just died down at 2-0. It was game over. It's game over. And, and as we've spoken about before, it's when Barcelona are on top, they usually go for the juggler. They go for the third, the fourth, and fifth. And Madrid, they've won the last, I believe, four Clascos in La Liga. And they've never had a big scoreline like this. And they played against some four Barcelona sides. Yeah, our biggest scoreline was 3-1. 3-1 and a 2-0. The rest were one goal margins. And obviously, because it's Twitter, it's football Twitter, Carlo Ancelotti's uh, position has been on the question, per se, for losing, a, in my opinion, a, a somewhat meaningless game in terms of the grand scheme of things in La Liga. We'll mm-hmm. see whether it affects them later on, but do you think that's fair, given what we've seen do you think that's what we've seen is evidence enough to say he's maybe not the right tactical manager for Real Madrid going forward um I think tactically he's always been just like a a short-term plug that we're basically bringing into the club for stability so in terms of that aspect he's doing his job very well because like not many thought going into the season a lot of people thought we wouldn't be you know, challenging for the title, we wouldn't have the points lead that we would have had right now. Against PSG, we all thought we were going to get knocked out. So, essentially, he's doing his job well, but it's another case of what we saw in the late stages of Zidane, where we're not really using our squad to its fullest. There's just, like, a lot of potential that can be done a lot more tactically with this team that's not being done. We're basically just doing the bare minimum to get by that kind of thing. So I wouldn't say necessarily it's an indictment on Carlo in the long term because I don't think anyone actually foresees him as the long term. But in the now, he's basically the best that we could bring in without necessarily doing like a whole shift and going towards a more tactical, preferably one of the younger uh, tactical coaches, which would have been risky to go into with a squad that's still in transition. Yeah, and in terms of those tactical changes that you want to see, because that can sometimes appear vague like what specifically would you change in the squad that what do you think Carlo Ancelotti can improve on with his use of the squad for me I think it's just a matter of trusting your squad a lot more and finding solutions that aren't always like the obvious ones like I always talk about the Jovic situation where uh, yes Jovic hasn't lived up to expectations but in moments when he's actually been shown and trusted he's linked up well with Vinicius Isco still has some life to give. He's no longer at his best. But unlike the situations of like a Bale and a Hazard where we've kind of given them the chances and we know what's going on, I feel like all the other players need to 
get you know a bit more involved and the same goes for like Kamavinga and Fede where we know that Casemiro Cruz Modric is our best midfield three but for a long 38 game season and onwards they aren't at that level where we can trust them week in week out where we sort of have to give them breaks especially like Modric where we see the difference between like a tired Modric versus Modric who's fresh and like up for it in his game so I think we just need to be able to shuffle the pack a lot more and use basically use our players a lot better than what we're currently doing and not just keep relying on the same 11 the same ideas and I always go back to uh, Pep Guardiola as an example where even though of course his squad depth is unparalleled <laughs> like we can't <laughs> compare to that but the no. way he uses his team where like you can go into a game week in week out and you don't necessarily know what like which attackers are going to play or which system is going to be used i think the only thing that's basically set in stone in his team is the back five yeah. everyone else yeah one week rodri the next week gundawan the next week like all sorts of changes especially up front and attack i feel like that sort of flexibility although it can mess with momentum if you get it right early on in the season that can help you in the long term in terms of when you now need these players to come and bail you up when plan A doesn't work. Because now, like, for instance, if you were to throw in Jovic at halftime in this game, we're already down, the team's heads are down, Jovic has no confidence, like, nothing will change. So I, I just feel like it's, it's you just have to sort of give and take with that. Yeah, that is true. And um, I guess another question I want to ask you before I move on to the Barcelona perspective is... Mm-hmm. If I'm Carlo Ancelotti, right, and I'm listening to what you've just said, my thought would be, you know what, this is a Real Madrid team where we haven't really invested in. Our biggest Galactico sign-in in the last year mm-hmm. is Camavinga. I'm still waiting on Mbappe. I'm still waiting on all the big promises for Antonio Perez. Mm-hmm. As for this team in the summer, maybe next season things will be different when I get a bigger squad, a better squad, and Real Madrid uses that war chest, which we all know they have <laughs> because of that <laughs> Mbappe bid on strengthening the squad yeah i think we'll need to do that but i don't think that would change carlo's mind that much given the way that we've seen even in his past into madrid he sort of gets comfortable with what he knows and then he sticks with that throughout to the end that is true and oscar from a barcelona perspective like what's the feeling at the moment you must be going ecstatic yeah, I'm absolutely delighted with the performance. With come on, blow yeah. it a bit, blow it a bit. <laughs> uh, okay, okay, you guys got battered. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I've been holding in the pain of losing classicals for three years. Is it? It feels like six, but now I can laugh again. <laughs> and as soon as the as soon as the game started, I said. There's no way we're walking out of here with less than four because I don't know what why Real Madrid looked so okay. It was Carlos' fault because he gave a confusing system. But to give credit where credit is due, we were absolutely awesome. The space you guys gave us, we exploited it. Militao and Alaba have been solid all season, but they were terrible to play. Courtois, player of the month for February, is the main reason this was not double digits. I can't lie to you. Yeah, I'm sorry. I fully but, agree there. Yeah. I'm Fede Valverde, like Fede, but on the Barca perspective, it's nice to see everyone give a confident performance in such a big game because this has been something we've been lacking for the last two, three years, like performances in bigger games. But, you know, since February, we've done that against Atleti, against Valencia, Napoli, um, Athletic Club, and today. So, Hopefully, we can continue like this and see where the season takes us. Yeah, and what do you think it's down to? Is it down to the manager changing the tactics, or is it just down to Barca having brilliant players? Because you look at Dembele with the level he's on, Aubameyang and Ferran. This is a totally different team than in December when it was Ferran, Jukwa, Abde, and Lupe Young. Oh, God. Yeah. It's down to yeah. It's down to better players like having better options. It's also down to the fact that this manager has come in with an idea and has convinced the players. 
and this is what I want you guys to do. And everyone seems to be carrying it out, carrying out, carrying it out well. And yeah, if we look back at the classical in October, only six players that started today featured in that game. Wow. Because we had to play Dest on the wing and our only big chance that day he missed it. Hey, we had too many big chances that we just <laughs> were throwing them away. Honestly, yeah. I have to say, in the start of the first half, when Fran Torres missed a chance to make it 3 new, I was insulting him until he made the 3 new. Because I knew, like, in this level, if you don't take your chances, you'll get punished. But thankfully, we created more than enough today because of this, like, better players and this new idea Javi has brought. Yeah. And do you think this might be good enough for Barca to win the title? Yeah. yeah. I mean, to win... I'm not thinking of, I'm thinking about second now because at least we're close enough to Sevilla. Yeah. Because... But I think yeah, but I think any title is dependent on how this affects Real Madrid or whether it affects them. Yeah. I don't think it I don't think it will affect them too much because Benzema will come back. The main reason they really were this bad deal was not because Benzema wasn't there, it was because of what they did to compensate for him not being there. Being there yeah. That is true. And there were also Real Madrid were also missing Ferland Mendy, who's he's a general in defense. Like Real Madrid fans might not really like him because he doesn't do much or they'll say he doesn't do much going forward, but when he's in defense, he totally radicalizes the team, doesn't he, Tepiwa? Yeah. When Mendy's in the team, it's a completely different team. And I'd just like to pick up on something that Oscar mentioned about the mentality. I think today that was understated for Barcelona because this is the first time that I saw even late on in the game at 4-0, you were seeing uh, Eric Garcia celebrating block tackles, Araujo was celebrating throw-ins and everything. I haven't seen that side of Barcelona in about three, four years Yeah. as a Madrid fan. I'm, I haven't seen that side of them in the Classic in, in a long time. And even the way Barcelona plays, like with Xavi, you expect them to score like this, like beautifully constructed goals. But I see them, they do score beautiful goals, but a lot of it is very direct. Long yeah. Balls, chasing the channels, fast plays. Maybe Definitely. that's because he has that's the personnel that he has. But it's also say something about Xavi because I don't think that's the style his preferred style necessarily. But he's making the best use of the players he has. Yeah, I think he's being very flexible, and that's something that even me, I was a bit skeptical when he was coming in. I didn't think that we would see Xavi sort of bend because he still has those traditional. Uh, quote-unquote Barcelona values but the biggest thing that he's done he's basically embraced what he has on hand and he's using that like basically what every coach should be doing is just basically get the best of the resources that you have yeah. and then worry about everything else later on yeah and you also have to oh, sorry Ted yeah it's just one more point for Tapiwa Real Madrid they have Celta away Sevilla mm-hmm. away Atletico away Osuna away Cadet mm-hmm. away how confident are you that they wouldn't throw the league away from in their road form in those games away from home? Because those are like some like Osuna is a tough place to go. Celta, they're doing okay. They're defensively solid. Sevilla and Atletico, you don't have to say much about them. Mm-hmm. And I think I'm not worried. Um, I'm not worried in terms of dropping the actual league itself because I think I've also mentioned this to both of you before. I think we'll make it a tough finish. So it's going to be closer than it needs to be. But I think in the end, we'll be able to just ride it out. Because again, like I always laugh, Madrid, we don't know how to close things off. <laughs> so <laughs> definitely, we are out of those games. We're definitely going to lose and draw at least two of them. Yeah. But then we'll, we should have enough in the tank to see it out. See it out. Yeah. And Oscar, you're about to make a point. Yeah, I was saying that, that Javi depending on the opponent has been willing to even like defend quite a bit yeah and like yeah basically like like tapiwa brilliantly said making use of what he has like we have fast direct players he's made use of them and when we've had to defend a bit in some games we've had to so and we've been able to do it and we that high line that has constantly plagued us hasn't really been and exploited that that much recently. Yeah, that's true. 
That is very true. Uh, but it did somewhat get exploited against Galatasaray, didn't it? Uh, yeah, during the week, they really gave us a tough time of it. But it wasn't like b- as bad as it used to be, where all you had to do was just look up and you're in behind us. Yeah. Yeah. It's like even today, Tersturgeon, like he didn't really have that much to do. That was like somewhat weird for El Clasico. Yeah. And he saved his first shot on target. Oh, yeah. For once. <laughs> for once. Yeah. Yeah. I guess let's, let's move on from. Barca and Real Madrid movement from El Clasico. And let's talk about Spanish football in general in Europe this week because it has been a mixed bag in terms of how they've done. In the Champions League, Spanish teams have done really well, like brilliant performances from Atletico, from Villarreal. But in the Europa League, it was a different picture. Do do we want to start with the Europa League or the Champions League, the good or the bad? The bad. The bad, Start okay. The bad, yeah. Oh, the bad, <laughs> okay. So, who are you gonna whip first, Sevilla or Betis? Sevilla. Sevilla, yeah. They were. It, it's hard to explain because that game is a microcosm of their season. Whenever they've done things to their strengths, they've looked very good. In the first half against West Ham, I felt they were the more likely team to score until West Ham actually scored. But after the second half, they just collapsed, didn't they? Yeah, it was I, I, the, the fact that West Ham scored and got that energy from the crowd, like that completely overwhelmed Sevilla. They barely got anything together. Anytime they had the ball, they were just passing it sideways. It was basically like a ticking clock onto when West Ham would get the ball and put pressure on them again. The injuries and the absences, we've all known that these have affected them, but still, they could have and should have done better than what they did after the second half. Yes, yes. And Tapiwa, how yeah. much of a blame do you think Lopetegui has to, to take from this? Because tactically, it's not the same Sevilla that we saw two years ago, even last year, that were very good and you mm. could rely on them. This year, they've been very unreliable. I think it would technically be 50-50 blame because, of course, like Oscar mentioned, the injuries have hurt them a lot. But at the same time, Lopetegui hasn't done well to adapting to those injuries, especially that West Ham game. Like, Sevilla looked lost <laughs> after the yeah. first half. There was no hope. That's like one of those games where you completely lose hope and you're just like, okay, ref, just blow the whistle. And let it be over and done with. Oh, let Sevilla go. Yeah. And that's something that's surprising me because... I've always thought Lopetegui was very flexible and I thought like the signing of Martial and like a lot of other players coming in would help them, especially with that attack. But now Sevilla are sort of like in a position where uh, Lopetegui's early Madrid was in where they're good and stable defensively, but beyond that, they just, they just look lost. Yeah. They look like a boxer who's like gotten a million haymakers and he's just (laughs) waiting and hoping that the game ends in a tie or a technical tie or something. Yeah, he's just hanging in there. He's just hanging in there. And that's the that's the microcosm of their season since January or even since December. Like, they've struggled in bits. It, it's just, it's been a weird sort of season for them. And this weekend against Real Sociedad, again, we saw the same thing. They should have lost by two or three. I don't know how, how they made it out of that game, 0-0. Zero, zero. But should we move on to Betis? Uh, yes. Yeah. Sure. So for Betis, it, it, that was heartbreak, pure heartbreak. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how they picked themselves up. It's like I going into. I was watching both games, and I was like, you know what, Sevilla's game is almost dead. The Betis game might go to the penalty shootout, so that might be exciting. But it's like things just happen against you. But they didn't really deserve to go through over two legs, because Eintracht created so many chances, especially at the Via Marine. Yeah. The fact that the second leg, coming into it, they were close, was a complete injustice to how well Frankfurt played in the first game. Even the second leg, Frankfurt created a few chances, hit the bar twice. Real Betis hit them late on with an equalizer, and immediately, like, not up to 30 minutes after that, karma <laughs> You know, it was a real team for real betters. Yeah. Losing in such a heartbreaking way. Another goalkeeping error. You know. 
Yeah, and a question for both of you. Will it be fair to call this better season? Like, better since Sevilla, there were two teams in December. We all had high expectations for them, doing one in Europe, maybe Sevilla even competing for uh, La Liga. But can we say for both of them, the season has been a failure for the Sevilla teams? Um, I, I can go first. I think I would say a failure given what we know now like with the potential of what they could have done but i don't think it's a failure overall in terms of if they're assessing from going into the season because going into the season especially real betis they would have taken the season being in the copa del rey final maybe not the europa elimination and then sevilla on the other hand maybe they were looking to build on uh, what they did last season and they would be a little more disappointed so i'd say maybe sevilla will be very disappointed whereas betis they'll kind of take it. Yeah, yeah. And just on to your point with Betis, because they don't have the squad. I don't think they have the squad to fight on all three fronts, and they've done it for so long. And it's just don't have the legs. Like, both of them look super tired. They look out of ideas. Like like I said, they're like, they've taken a couple of haymakers, and they're just like, let's send the season right now, and let's take what we have. Yeah, it feels that way. More for Sevilla. At least Real Betis have a cup final to play for, and that is a huge deal for them. Even if they don't win that cup final, I don't think Real Betis will look at this season as a failure because it's back-to-back and um, getting to Europe for just the second time in how many years. For Sevilla, they look back on it as a failure only if they somehow blew top four. Other than that, it's still a relative success. Like, you take what you get. Yeah. And knowing Sevilla, it's definitely impossible for them to blow top four. <laughs> yeah, by just drawing every single game to the end of the season. Yeah. I think yeah. they've got, what, like seven seven of their last games are all draws. Well. Draws, oh my God. And they, they haven't won away from home since, I, I think, in the last eight, seven or eight games as well. So it's it's crazy what, what's gone on there. But let's move on to the good for Spanish football. Let's talk about the Champions League. Both of you are Manchester United fans, so it's interesting we have both of you here. And how much of a moral victory should Atletico take from that win at Old Trafford? A massive one. Not just from that win at Old Trafford, but how they've been playing since the end of February. It's been a return to Cholo- Choloismo. Yeah. You know, being solid counter-attacking masterclasses, you know, MC Muni getting the best out of random players, like Lodi is now a goal scorer. <laughs> Koke has returned back to his good friend. Felix is, you know, playing really well. Renildo has been awesome since he started, like, playing at the back for them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd have to... Oh, sorry. Oh, go on, Taps. Yeah, I was about to say, I'd have to fully agree with Oscar on that. I think... This this February has well past month going into March has really brought back like the good feelings for Atleti again revolving around that Cholismo. We hadn't seen them showing this combative side of them in, in a very long time. Since I'd say maybe since like November, December. Yeah. We hadn't really seen a good Atleti. They were still getting results here and there. But that win at Old Trafford, I think it'll galvanize them well. The same way that the win at against Liverpool did. I think it will, will have that same positive effect on them. That's true. And if, if I could name three three names that have been part of this Atleti um, recovery or remontada of their season, so you can say, I'll say Joao Felix has been one because he's playing almost every game. And you can see how that's boosting his confidence. He gave an assist this weekend. He was vital in the goal that Manchester, that Atleti scored in at Old Trafford. Mm-hmm. Also, Lodi for like his goal, his goal in, again, his goal against Manchester United, his assist in the first leg, and the final one, as Oscar said, is Ronaldo. He's been an amazing signing. He's he's like Mendy. He's a Mendy region essentially. Yeah, and that one is very surprising for me because I remember I was even talking down Ronaldo. I didn't think he would have as good an impact so early for them. Yeah. And let's move on to Villarreal because they they even got an even more spectacular win. In the Champions League, three zero in Juventus in Turin. Who saw this coming? I saw them winning, but three nil. Now I'd be lying if I told you <laughs> that they win three, that they scored more than 
one or two at the Allianz Stadium. Yeah, and, and everyone is going to see them as like the cannon fodder of the draw, but what did they do from both of you? What did they do tactically to get this kind of results against Juventus? Because not everyone does that. Even Chelsea, they lost to Juventus at the Allianz this season. Yeah, I think it's three things. Organization and belief in like the second one was more conditional because they had to wait for Jared to come on, but like belief in your quality. And the third one was a bit of luck because in the first half, Juve had a very had a few good chances, really made excellent saves. And you do have to ride your luck sometimes in knockout football, but when they like weather the storm the second half, they completely out allegri that allegri. And when UV had like run out of ideas, they brought on Jared and just finished off um, UV's chances. Yeah. And Tapiwa, like how much of a difference has Re made since the start of the season? Because he was making mistakes here and there, but in both legs against Juventus, he has been brilliant. Yeah, he was a monster for them. Like without really in goal in that second game, I actually don't think they win that game because. I feel like if a couple of those early chances early on go the other way, like Oscar was saying, sometimes you have to ride your luck. If a couple of those early chances go the other way, Villarreal would have probably completely switched off in that game. And I think Ruli's been really good, especially given how shaky he was at the beginning of the season. It's been it's been a good change for him. Yeah. And with the results of this week, like does that change the narrative around Spanish football? Because everyone and their mother things like the league is dead but does this show that maybe it's not as good as it used to be in the 2010s but it's still a strong league yeah yeah i think for me it's like the past few years at least i've shown the strengths more of the teams behind real madrid atleti and barca because you have villarreal like pulling up trees in europe last year and this year and um, you had Granada, for instance, who got a couple of good results in the Europa League last year. Yeah. Yeah. The narrative around Spanish football having problems, in my opinion, is based on the ignorance belief that Spanish football is just Barcelona's problems and Real Madrid's problems. Yeah. So it's not something we should really take too seriously. Yeah, well said. Because I was actually going to echo that same uh, concept and say that I think people just tend to, anytime that Barcelona and Madrid are bad, and then occasionally if Atleti are bad, they'll blanket that with the entire league. Yeah. But as we've seen, like with this past few years, of course, we're not at the level that we used to be, but it's still a very competitive league. And with all these arguments, there always has to be nuance taken like between team from team and that sort of thing. But as we know on football Twitter, there's no, there's no <laughs> nuance. There's no nuance. <laughs> there's no nuance. Yeah. And, and I think... I might be wrong in the stats, but this is the first time in over 20 years we've had three teams in the in the quarterfinals that and one hasn't been Barcelona. So we've had Real Madrid, Atleti. We have Real Madrid, Atleti, and Villarreal. The last time this happened, we had Real Madrid, Deportivo, and Valencia in 2001. So that's that's huge. Like having like those two teams going through to the quarterfinals without having Barcelona. I think that's huge. Yeah. Opinion. I think it's very big, especially for VRL. If yeah. if they can have two good legs against Bayern, even even if they lose, yeah. as long as they perform admirably, I think it's a win for Spanish football. Yeah, yeah. but that'll be a discussion for another day because we all know what, <laughs> what Bayern can do. Yeah. yeah, I know that only too well. <laughs> yeah, and going back to La Liga, like we had some couple of like one zero games. Valencia beat LK. Nothing much to speak about. Ugly go by Gonzalo Guedes. And yeah. Espanyol beating Mallorca too. That's that's an interesting storyline because Sergio Dada was like, how underrated is this guy? He he had a good assist today. Yeah, this guy is like he can play exit done if he chooses to. <laughs> he, like he's so he's like he, you can't get win the ball off him because he's so press resistant. His final ball is quality. I believe now he has three goals and seven assists this season. And I heard that like he was in consideration for the national team. So that kind of shows you, at least not just in Espanol circles, he's thought of as a very good footballer. Well, yeah. 
And Tapiwa, should we be worried about Mallorca? Because they haven't won in a while. I think it's, this is their sixth consecutive, consecutive defeat. Yeah, so Mallorca's season with that loss just got a whole, a whole lot complicated. And I'm not too sure if they'll be able to survive this, but it'll be interesting to see what happens going on to the season. Yeah, Especially dude. that now that Cadiz won their game as well. Yeah, Cadiz yeah, won. Yeah. yeah, and that's a huge game. That's a huge win for Cadiz because new managers come in. I think this win might take them out of the bottom three. I mean, it just it complicates did. everything. Yeah, takes them out of the relegation zone. Complicates everything because, like, you look at the, the teams around Mallorca, Hetafe, they had a good point at San Mamez. I, I don't see where Mallorca, like how they can survive this. It's I think it's between them and Cadiz, but they look like they're on the way down. Yeah. Mallorca, they had like a couple of good games when Muriki came in and he made some impact, but since then they've shown little imagination going forward. The one game they had a lot of chances was against Valencia, but even then they just wasted all of them. And yeah. Given how Mallorca generally struggled to create chances, because between them and Alaves, they, they, they are the size that have the lowest conversion rate at six yeah. percent, which is just terrible. So yeah, I don't think they'll stay up. I think Cadiz, because Sergio has come in, he's a well like he's well versed with the Primera and staying up. He's a he's terrorist. Added, he's a terrorist, and sometimes you need a bit of football terrorism to stay yeah. up. And you can even see. It was an emotional win for Cadiz because you could see what it meant to them not to go down. Yeah, yeah that is true. Yeah. And on Alaves, if Mallorca had a bad weekend, they had an even worse weekend because they had that 6 pointer against Granada. It looked like they were going to win, but Granada, out of nowhere, they came back. How big is that for Granada? Does that change the dynamic of what they've gone through this year? Yeah, a little bit because they were on a really terrible run themselves. I think what really helped them during that terrible run was the fact that nobody in the bottom was taking advantage. Levante were the only team trying, but then they're just too far now. Yeah. Alaves, some people other than Hossel finally stepped up, but then, you know, in defense, they decided to take a um, nap <laughs> this weekend. Yeah, oh man. It, it, is, it is terrible for them. And Tapiwa, what's, what do you think has changed with Alaves this season compared to the previous seasons? Is this just a continuation or has something fundamentally changed to make them this bad this season? Because I, I think they're the worst team in La Liga. I would say it's a continuation. It's more of the same. I, I think they really need to go back to the drawing board, so to speak, this and week. actually make some actual changes. Because... You, you wouldn't think that going down for Granada would sort of somehow galvanize them and just completely turn the tide of this game. <laughs> like, it was just one of those games. Right Maybe, yeah. <laughs> and Levante, they're, they're hopeless. Like, can we write them off at this point? Yes. Yeah, Levante yeah. are Sa gone. You know, sadly, I, I want them to stay up because they really keep things interesting in the <laughs> league with some of the results yet. But, you know, after taking a few steps forward, they took a massive step back yesterday. They defend the guy. They conceded yeah. from a quickly taking free kick. That day. Like that free kick? I still don't know what happened on that free kick. <laughs> <laughs> when I saw it, I was like, what? Everyone and then the third the goal players. as well. The third goal yeah. as well. I forgot which defender at the back gave it away. And they were just... It was, again, just mistakes undoing themselves. And, mm -hmm. again, we normally see this with sides that are in the relegation zone, but when your confidence is that low, it just, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. They it's have more happen. kids this season than wins. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but to be fair, in their defense, it was a nice kid. It was, it's a nice kid, though. Shame we won't be seeing it next season. Next season. Uh, I just want to talk about NSU now for, for a moment. Ooh, like I Oscar, we, we, we know you love him, but... Do you think he's going to stay at Hetafe? He's the second, joint second top scorer in La Liga. He has to leave next season, doesn't he? Yeah, I, I don't think anyone has really made any bid for him or shown any interest. So, barring any interest from maybe a Celta or a team like that that are like comfortably mid table but would take that next step, I think he'll stay at Hetafe. Yeah, I, think, I think he stays as well. 
I also think that giving, let's see what Quique Sanchez Flores can do with a full season where he doesn't come in with a massive handicap. Yeah. Like, honestly, I, I could see him doing a job at Sevilla if they sell NSR or even going back to Villarreal, but it, <laughs> it, it's both of you are right. It is difficult to see him at any place other than Hetafe. And with that, should we move on to Serie A, guys? Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Tapiwa, you're a Milan fan. How happy are you about this season so far? It's been, you know, it's been an up and down season for them. A lot, a, just like roller coaster, <laughs> completely <laughs> confusing. But like, I feel like the good has come in now that Milan has started to actually capitalize whenever Inter started making mistakes. And I feel like that whole Pazza Inter term comes back <laughs> into play again because Inter have not looked themselves since 2022 started. Uh-huh. They turned up in the Champions League. They were put on a really good display against Liverpool. But outside of that, they've just been dropping games left, right, and center. And initially, Milan was also dropping a lot of those points against the smaller teams. But now Milan has started, like Pioli has just started being able to grind out wins. So these recent games, they haven't really played well, but they've just been able to get the job done. Pioli on fire, eh? Serie A's yeah. terrified. <laughs> and Napoli, they're, they're getting the job done as well with them. It seems like it will be between Inter, Napoli, Milan. Milan on the top. There's an asterisk on Napoli, though. They're Why? heavily reliant on It's Napoli. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The fact that it's just seven points, I'm not really not you. You're just walking, walking and taking this thing last minute. <laughs> If, if yeah, you, the, the fact that Juve even got this close is <laughs> is is insane because yeah. Inter, Napoli, and Milan between them they have this bad habit of just losing concentration over two or three games, and yeah, who knows who's going to be top of the table in the next two weeks? Yeah, who knows? Probably <laughs> Juve. Yeah, probably. <laughs> Tapio, well, let's talk a bit about Inter for a moment because in December. I would have guessed that they would have had Serie A wrapped up. There, were, there was a period of time where they were about to play Napoli and they were about to play Milan. And if they had won both both games, the league would have been done. But now, yep. the third. Yep. And ever since the, the Milan derby, they just, again, they just haven't looked the same. Because they drew with Napoli. Then they ended up losing to Sassuolo. They picked up some more draws. Then, you know, they beat some smaller teams here and there. But they just genuinely don't look the same and i i can't tell if it's something that's like mental to them or if it's tactical because the players are still playing well but there seems to be like a reluctance from simone and zagi to sort of change things up and he keeps giving players like alexis more chances than they need so <laughs> i don't know and then you rest jeko for the bigger games and then jeko comes and he doesn't perform in those games it's it's just confusing and do you think it might be something that maybe Simone and Zaghi will have to go? Or do you look at Inter and the fact they lost Hakimi, they lost Ericsson, they lost Lukaku, mm. and maybe give Inzaghi one more season to get... No, I, I, I don't think he has to go. I, I think he's he's doing a really good job. Like, in the in the bigger picture thing of things, at the beginning of the season, a lot of us wouldn't have said that Simone and Zaghi would have had them challenging for the title. We would have expected them to stay in the top four but to actually be as good as they were at the beginning of the season, I don't think a lot a lot of people saw that coming. Because Simone Inzaghi is one of those coaches, again, who just gets underrated. The way we see some mid-table coaches in La Liga that are really good, but you know they don't get that adulation outside. And we're now seeing that with Inzaghi now that he's gone to Inter. But I think even if they don't win the title, I don't think it should be a case of firing them. Right then. Yeah. I think give them another shot. And the biggest game in Italy this weekend was the Roma Derby and Jose Mourinho. He came up big. He shut up some of his critics. Yeah, Tammy. Tammy had a a very big game. (laughs) Like, that was actually surprising because I thought Roma would win given um, their form coming into this, but I didn't think it would be as drastic. Like, Sarri's players just look completely lost. Roma playing with confidence. Mourinho doing his antics on the touchline as usual, <laughs> telling the fans to calm down, you know, yeah. not get carried away. It's yeah. it's probably one of the most comfortable victories they've had this season. This season, yeah. And a word on, on Mourinho, first of all. 
how would you classify his season? Do you think it has been likely a success or do you think Roma are still somewhat underperforming? Should they be at the level of Juventus, Napoli and, and the Milan clubs? Nah, I wouldn't say they're underperforming in terms of their actual position in the table and where they should be. I would only say they've underperformed in terms of the actual performances on the pitch because they've had some really bad games throughout the season. <laughs> and that's again, that's... Yeah, and that's, again, probably something typical that we see with late-stage Mourinho ever since he <laughs> left Chelsea the second time. His teams do tend to have this in them. But the fact that he's, you know, on par to stay in the top seven, I think I think they're fifth right now. So as long as they secure European football, their objectives are sort of met. They would only be really disappointed in terms of how much they spent in the transfer window because I think they spent more than anyone in the transfer window to back Mourinho a bit, which, again, for me, I would have done the same if I was uh, Roma's new owners, but I wouldn't back him to the extent of where, you know, we can just waste money because Roma still have a ceiling. So for them, being able to push top four and maybe go on a cup run, I think is a successful season in their books. Yeah. And let's talk about Atalanta because they've been the darling figure for Italian football in a while. They're the last Italian team, I believe, in the Champions League and the Europa League. How well can they do in that tournament? Can they go all the way and get to a final? Uh, yeah, um, they have a very tough game against Leipzig. But, you know, if they get over that, yeah, they have Rangers or... I, I forgot who the other team Braga. was, but... Braga. Yeah, Braga. Uh, Rangers and Braga have had very good European performances this season, so they'll still be a tough test for Atalanta. But, yeah... It's a real chance for them to really represent Syria and bring some European glory back. Yeah, and I'd, I'd genuinely be happy for Gasparini if, if Atalanta was to go far because I feel like they didn't get their justice from the that Champions League run where they ended up collapsing against PSG. I really I'm feel like, again. yeah, if they didn't collapse there, I feel like they could have you know, surprised a lot of people in the Champions League. And so if Gasparini can get to a final... Maybe get some silver, right? It'll be good for him. Good, yeah. Serie A is one of the best title races in Europe, but in the Premier League, the title race is heating up at the moment. And I was, we'll talk about one club because they will be the common thread, and that's Arsenal, surprisingly. But hear me out. They played Liverpool during the midweek. Liverpool won, and that means they're just one point behind Manchester City. How did City collapse over these series of games? Because yeah, that's such a comfortable lead. Yeah, I think it's just a case of City running out of gas one and some teams like Patrick Vieira's Crystal Palace being able to figure out you know, the weaknesses of not having a fake center forward. I don't think that City have really had a bad collapse because they've only, besides losing to Tottenham, they drew against Southampton and Crystal Pass. I just think the other team was that Liverpool had a few games in hand because of COVID and all those yeah. things. Yeah. And it made yeah. it look as if there wasn't really any tight series. But, you know, a dropped point here, a game in hand one here, and now we have a tight series there. Yeah, the game in hand point is a great point because they were always, the gap against Liverpool was always inflated because of those games in hand. But if we always took those as wins, because like you said, essentially they've only dropped, what, three games two draws and a loss which again it's bad to do when you're this close in the title race but it's not as dramatic as people are making it out to be be. and if you were to bet hundred dollars on who won this title who would you go with Liverpool or Manchester City I'd still stick with City yeah I'd stick with City as well I think Liverpool have the momentum but I think City have enough to see it out it out and a lot of people think both teams rightly or wrongly are the favorites to win the champions league do you guys see both of them who would you see winning it or who do you see going further between both of them when it comes to the champions league i think liverpool always has the advantage there because i just feel like they've been there done that they seem more set up as a cup team because as we've seen pep can do it in a league season but when it comes to those cup competitions, he often experiments, does the, I don't know if like he gets into his own head or anything like that. But yeah, I think the past maybe three, four years, the favorites have easily been 
City, Liverpool, Bayern. Occasionally, yeah. people will throw in PSG because of the talent they have, but not because of actual performance. But I think City, Liverpool, and Bayern are essentially the three deadliest teams in Europe right now. That's true. Yeah, I have to agree. If it's a Champions League situation or just a club situation generally, I'll back a club team or very pep team. That team. Yeah, and let's move back to Arsenal for a bit because they also won this weekend. We're speaking more about them because they're in the top four now. They're becoming more and more relevant, right? And like Tapiwa, what do you think has changed for them so far? Because they keep on picking up wins and it looks like they are going to finish in top four. Or do you think other teams might challenge them for that top four? I think right now they have the best momentum in that top four race because again spurs are just on win loss win loss win loss united look a shambles <laughs> like <laughs> united's advantage is completely gone and again arteta has just seemed to have found a tune out of his young core especially uh, emil smith rowe odegaard and bukayo saka that trio of youngsters like at back in january we would have thought like letting go of Bamiyang was a high risk situation for arsenal but i think Arteta has been fully vindicated, even though Aubameyang is doing well. I think that separation was just healthy for both parties. It's a win-win situation for both sides. Both sides, yeah. And do you see them going all the way, both of you? Yeah, they yeah, should have I, enough to see. Yeah, and with that, we're going to go t- towards the Bundesliga. Bayern Munich, again, they were in, the, in their winning mode. Lewandowski is up to 30 goals a season. The Ballon d'Or criteria has changed, and it's judged over the course of the season now. He, is he the favorite for it? Yeah, I'd say he and Benzema and Salah are the favorites based on this season. Exactly. But yeah, since it's seasonal, at least it's good that they have a criteria. I guess the winner <laughs> of the Champions League will win it because all three have a good chance of winning their league. I guess the Champions League might be the deciding factor in the Ballon d'Or winner. Yeah, I'd have to agree there. All yeah. three are favorites, and it'll just lean to whoever wins. But I hope in the end of the day, the changes are actually good. Because now at least there's no confusion over it. Sure. There's no like one, five good games in the World Cup and still it's. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and Bayern's main rivals are Borussia Dortmund. They dropped points this week. Erling Haaland was anonymous, according to most Dortmund fans. Is his mind elsewhere? I wouldn't say his mind is elsewhere, but I would say the team as a whole has just been a shambles. <laughs> like mentally this season, they've, especially the defensive line, and I think it starts from them being so shaky at the back. It's like the rest of the team can't have any confidence. They're always like, like constantly looking at their shoulders. They've had so many injuries, like they can't catch a break. It's just been a whole lot of factors. And I think, again, the whole Holland saga is adding to that, but I don't think it's necessarily distracting them. I think the whole, it's just Dortmund playing badly as a whole in so, this situation, yeah. But you'd be surprised because Dortmund, they're six points going by, which isn't a... It's a it's a huge margin, but it's not like the biggest margin in the world. They still have to play Bayern in the Alliance Arena. Thanks, Oscar, for reminding me that it's not in played in Dortmund. Uh, yeah, they've got. Still I a think. Chance. Yeah, I think they. There's still a chance, but only a chance in numerical value. <laughs> Otherwise, outside of that, Dortmund has actually technically given up. And uh, even like, uh, there's a couple of Bundesliga group chats that I'm in as well. And it's looking bleak. A lot of people have sort of just accepted it. So even going into these games, I think they have Leipzig, uh, Wolfsburg, and another game. I'm not sure what the third game they have before Bayern. People are expecting them to drop at least two of those three games. That's how, like, down on morale that everyone is. <laughs> yeah, I, I can imagine that. Because even after that Rangers game, that was, like, surprising. In the Champions League, they should have done way better in their group. So... Yeah, it's been really surprising because especially Marco Rosa going into the season looked like a really good tactical fit for this Dortmund team because you bring in Malin, you probably play a diamond and you're able to incorporate Malin and Holland and then bring in Marco Royce behind there or occasionally switch it to Gio Reyna. Like everything looked in place at the beginning of the season. But then injuries happen. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, so, and speaking of crisis, let's move over to League 1, where <laughs> PSGG, <laughs> we're talking about them again. Another away game, another disaster class. And this time, there was no Leo Messi to blame. Uh, I'm not going to say, like, they shouldn't have booed. Like, obviously, they should be disappointed in his performances, but I'm not going to turn around and say, that's what you get for booing Messi or something. Because <laughs> if he was there, they would have gotten packed up the same way. But starting why not them on the right wing, I don't think that's... <laughs> okay, let's look at it like this. I've had this conversation with many people. Besides five or six PSG players that are world-class, the core of that squad is not really that good. And you see it's like when some people get injuries, like if any of the French you get injured, the option is a cardio or drugs. Yeah. And it's actually surprising given how many, how much good young French talent they've let go. Yeah. Because yeah. the likes of Christopher Nkunku, Mike Maignan, <laughs> all of these players were all PSG Youth Academy. And, and they, they were all yeah, Labour then... tossed aside. It's Nico, man. Yeah, but but on this game, a, a La Liga boy scored two goals. A former La Liga boy, Benietta. Sevilla could do with him right now, couldn't they? I still they miss really like selling Benietta. I stick to this is the biggest mistake that Sevilla ever made, <laughs> in my opinion. Uh, but with PSG, this could be a long, like it could be a long spell to the title, like a long depressing spell to the title because we know they're gonna win it. But it's like, it's going to be a tough watch for them because they just look all over the place right now. Yeah. This reminds me of back in 1819 after my United beat them, like, had that incredible comeback. There was a time where they were just losing Ligon games, almost winning the. <laughs> and yeah, it's like, and then they, it didn't help that they lost the cup final then that time. But now that there's literally nothing else to play for, I can just see it's being like a funeral. Yeah. <laughs> And what changes yeah. do you think needs to be made, Tapiwa, for next season so they can have a stronger squad going forward in the Champions League? I think they'll need to divorce uh, Poch. I like him as a coach, but I think him and PSG were never a good fit to begin with, especially as we've seen like other coaches struggle with this whole star power mentality in PSG. They need to, if I'm them, I would throw everything I have at uh, Gaultier yeah. and let him rebuild everything. Scrap a lot of these contracts, your <laughs> Union Draxlers, all of these other, like, I think they still have Levin Kruzao on the books. And <laughs> wow. also, Seriously. All of these players just need to be scrapped and letting go of Mbappe will work for the team, but I'm not too sure if you should build the attack around Neymar and Messi. That's where I'm a bit confused because I'm not too sure like who they can bring because maybe they could go for Holland as the third in that striker role. But if I'm them, I would go back to the roots. Again, like we were saying, all of that young French talent. Uh, we all know Julian Laurent always brags about Paris born and bred. There is actually so much talent in that Paris area that I feel like they need to find that perfect blend between bringing in stars but also bringing in a lot of useful role players like boost up the level of your bench and depth and everything, and then worry about the superstars as the icing on the cake. That, that is true. And even moving on to the next league on game, Marseille, they played they play Nice and they won. But Marseille have Kamara, who's a defensive midfielder, who can play PSG. He's not, he's not a contract, but PSG is not linked for them. Which is surprising, right? Because like you have, you, you have this pool of talents in Liga, and you don't even use it. <laughs> you yeah, just let it go to... Sorry. Perhaps. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. I was saying you just let this other talent go to other teams and then they come back to bite you in Europe. Yeah, I was going to echo the same. They just let all these players leave to other leagues. They bounce around leagues or bouncing around the mid-table sides in mm -hmm. Ligue 1 and just... If I, yeah, if I found PSG, like, it's so simple. Do what Juve and Bayern did. Cannibalize your own league. It's not, I know it's not a good thing to advocate, yeah. but in this situation, when that's your option, or throwing money at, like, a lot of unproven, like, talent, talented, but not, like, actually performing players, I would rather take the gamble with the proven league on young talent. Uh, yeah. Do you guys remember Cedric Bacambu? 
Yeah, very yeah, good scored, striker. He scored in this game. <laughs> yeah, it's all the La Liga strikers, from La Liga strikers. They they did a good job in the gun this week. Yeah. And on a final note, I'm going to give Oscar the credit for predicting Benfica versus Ajax. Tapira, do you see that coming? Nope. I did not see that result coming at all. I thought Ajax would have made hard work for themselves, but I didn't think Benfica had it in them to actually get the job done, just because I thought that Ajax team had too much firepower in that attack for Benfica to be able to stop them. Yeah, and Oscar, you can gloat again. Yeah, uh, my boy Darren Nunez did his team. Yeah, <laughs> forget this Haaland, this Vlaovic, that Mbappe, this that's the guy. <laughs> Yo, don't play. I, I I found Darren Nunez first, bro. Okay, you found him first, but then you know, after I saw what he did to Eric Garcia, I was completely <laughs> convinced that this is the man. <laughs> yes, <Yeah, it's> the... <laughs> yeah, but yeah. Ajax were unlucky sometimes in that tie, but you know, if you don't take your chances in football, you'll get punished. Yeah, that's true. Sometimes you'll get away with it. Eventually, it will catch up to you. And with the one good chance Benfica got, they scored. Yeah, that, that's so true. And with that, we're going to end the podcast. Tapiwa, thanks again for coming. It was always nice to hear your perspective. Of- no. no problem. Thank you, you guys, for bringing me on. I always Thanks love listening to this podcast. On, like, I always laugh. Like every Tuesday morning, it's gone into rotation easily. <laughs> yeah, we really appreciate that. And, and Oscar again. Thanks for coming on. Mm, thanks for having me. Conversation. And with that, guys, thank you and adios. Adios.